to eSports in the Capital Markets, a special presentation of the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with Amica eSports and the Dales Report. Join the CSE as we investigate the world of eSports in a post-COVID world, including the themes and players that will dominate the next era of this rapidly growing industry. We will explore the impact of legalized gambling on the sector and the massive potential this convergence will have for investors. Where education meets opportunity, this is eSports in the Capital Markets. Good afternoon, folks. This is eSports in the Capital Markets. I'm your host today, James Black, and joined today with me by none other than Philip Shum. Both of us, we work for the Canadian Securities Exchange. We're really excited to be hosting this today. How are you doing today, Phil? Doing great. How are you? Good. I've been looking forward to this event for uh, quite some time. So back in May, uh, CSE hosted a big cannabis event. Uh, it was four-parter. This time it's just one. It's one just nice two-hour event that we're going to be hosting and uh, showcasing today. Uh, a broad discussion on the esports industry. Obviously, esports has been a um, it's been a hot term the last couple of years, uh, especially on the public market side. We've seen a lot of listings come to the CSE in the esports and gaming space. But there's been a wrinkle recently. There's been a really important wrinkle on the uh, on the gambling side. Maybe, Phil, you can just kind of walk us through today's agenda, some of the stuff we're going to be uncovering and the impact that, uh, you know, the new Bill C-218 could have on this whole industry. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're going to uh, hear, hear from some uh, subject matter expert, Cameron McDonald from BOG on uh, Bill C-218. Um, he's been uh, very much involved with working with a lot of different uh, companies to to figure out what that looks like. Uh, on top of that, we're we're going to hear from some of the players. We've got various esports uh, companies that are attached with the CSC, and then you'll so you'll hear about what they're doing, what they're looking to do, uh, and uh, you know uh, possibly uh, seek a couple of investors from the audience here. But above above and beyond that, uh, we uh, we've got two great panels. One is on esports, uh, generally speaking, to you know get an understanding of what it's all about, uh, and I should say actually esports and gaming. And then the second panel is focused uh, specifically on Bill C-218 and what 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 we're hearing specifically from um, uh, uh, some of the issuers that are attached with uh, the CSE. Yeah, and in this uh, session today, we're actually gonna be profiling some of the public companies and possibly soon to be public companies uh, that are a part of this whole ecosystem. So we'll have a meet the players introduction uh, before each segment today, like I said, there'll be two main segments. First on esports, the second on gaming and esports. Uh, gaming as in gambling, basically. And then uh, we'll, we'll uh, obviously introduce everyone that's involved prior to that. So uh, I just want to give a quick thanks uh, to our media sponsors, our media partners today, Amica Esports and The Dales Report. You'll get to know these guys a bit better throughout the session because they'll be hosting and moderating the two main panels that are a part of today's session. Um, but let's just take a quick step back, Phil. We we started uh, with a very basic premise for this. Companies are coming, they're listing, they're in the esports space. But why are people more generally excited about the esports space? I know you shared some stats. Maybe we can just talk about the stats before we kick into the first session. Sure. Um, so stat wise, I mean, we're looking at uh, esports revenue at this point. So everyone knows that this is a big space, but how big is it really? So if you're looking like from 2019. This is from New Zoo, which is one of the more established uh, esports or rather uh, uh, research uh, agencies. 950 million in 2019, uh, forecasted to go to 1.6 billion, which is about 11% CAGR. That's compounded annual growth rate between the five years. That's a pretty good number. Uh, this will continue to grow. Um, this is a global number. And then uh, respectively, there are you know, different uh, forecasts uh, from different different organizations throughout, um, or rather regionally. Uh, and if we go to the next one, uh, we look at, um, with revenue, of course, comes uh, audience. And so uh, New Zoo, again, uh, forecasting about 400 million uh, viewers, that is uh, occasional and esports enthusiasts, um, ranking, going all the way up to 577 in 2024. Again, a, a global number. 7.7% uh, 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 compounded annual growth rate, which is uh, very exciting because it just means that more and more people are watching it and there's more revenue to be, to come out of this industry. 
Yeah, it is exciting. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of great insights uh, soon to come here. So thanks again for watching. If you're on Air Meet, uh, I know Neil's in there. He's talking to everyone who's in there. Feel free to share in real time your comments or questions you might have about the content. Um, we are broadcasting this live also on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So uh, there's no shortage of places to watch this, but Air Meet is the best experience uh, because you can interact in real time with other participants. So Without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna start the uh, the session, the first panel, first with meet the players, and then we'll have our session hosted by um, Ben Pfefferman, and you're gonna learn a lot. So I'm really excited to get this thing started. Phil, are you excited? Let's go. It's gonna be <laughs> great. All right, cool. Hey guys, I'm Matt Bailey, CEO of Game On Entertainment Technologies, ticker symbol G E T. Get we recently listed just a couple of weeks ago. And what do we do? Uh, Game On Entertainment Technologies, we partner with the biggest and most watched content providers in the world. So we're talking teams, leagues, TV networks, OTT platforms, sports books, and everything in between. And we make their content more engaging and social. How do we do it? We do it through predictive gaming. So think things like prediction games, collectibles experience. Let me give you an example. Uh, we recently partnered with MX Player, one of the biggest and most watched uh, OTT platforms in India. So we'll be powering their prediction games, totally white labeled uh, prediction games that look and feel like their environment and Game On is the engine behind it. Uh, if you're in India and you're on the OTT platform, you'll be able to go in, make your predictions of what will happen during that game, uh, get points, compete against others, win prizes, and we power that technology totally programmatically for that content provider and making their content more engaging and social. We don't just do it in sports, we do it across entertainment as well. So we've recently partnered with NBC Universal, Bravo, for The Real Housewives. So we have a pipeline really, really full with content owners and content providers right across the spectrum from sports to entertainment. Now, why you should invest in us is not only because we have a great innovative product, but we also have a great team behind it as well. I come from sports. I've worked for the Brooklyn Nets and Barclays Center, uh, always on the business development side. Our chief product officer, Santi, uh, comes from a strong games background. He built FIFA EA Sports for many years and more recently was the mastermind behind NBA Top Shot at Dapper Labs. Our chairman was the original creator of Grand Theft Auto and still remains on the board of Take-Two Interactive. And we have various others uh, on our advisory board or, on our, or as a director from DraftKings, Skills, Media, Gaming and Sports. So we're the right guys to hit this out of the park. One more reason why you should invest in us is that we're super early. Uh, this is the right time to get involved and enjoy the ride and enjoy the upside with us. So again, this is Matt Bailey, CEO of Game On, and we look forward to talking more about our business soon. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Kevin Wright. I'm the president of Game Square Esports, and I'm really excited to uh, take a few minutes to walk you through what it is that we do and who we are. Uh, so GameSquare is a digital media and agencies business. We operate a, a talent agency called Code Red out of Europe, uh, and we, we operate a digital media group called the Gaming Community Network uh, out of Los Angeles. So that's the core of our business, and we think that the digital agencies are a really interesting place to be because you're sitting between the big brands that are coming into esports and the massive fan base that continues to grow, not just uh, from the pandemic, but as a new generation of uh, folks are coming into uh, media and engaging with video games as a really interesting place to be. And a lot of people ask us, you know, why are people watching video games? I can't imagine that. And the reality is that we don't have to understand why it's happening, but it is happening. There's 600 million people globally that are engaging with video games. Now, the other side of our business are esports organizations. And so we have a team in Asia and we have a team in South America that compete in Crossfire, which is one of the largest games in the world, and League of Legends, which is arguably the most popular and the biggest game uh, in the world. And so this gives us a global footprint by which to serve the brands that we, uh, we operate with. What differentiates us uh, in our mind is that we are targeting profitability sooner than 
you know, in our mind, as, as we understand it, any other organization uh, that's certainly that's publicly listed. So profitability is a really important piece. The other piece that differentiates uh, ourselves, I mentioned I was the president, uh, is our CEO, Justin Kenna, who was with FaZe Clan. FaZe Clan is the leading uh, esports brand in the world, the leading esports gaming lifestyle brand. And so Justin saw revenues grow by about 15x uh, and they nabbed the fourth spot on the Forbes list. So we think we're really well positioned in terms of profitable businesses that sit at the intersection of brands and fans. And we've got a management team with X phase clan uh, folks on it, uh, as well as leading uh, global uh, uh, company executives uh, out of the, uh, the US group. So we think we're really well positioned to continue to grow. We've done two uh, acquisitions since being public in October. Our market cap has increased 3x uh, in that time, and we're just getting started. So M&A is a very important part of our growth strategy alongside of the organic growth that we're driving within the business. So I'll leave it at that. We're GSQ on the CSE. Uh, and we look forward to answering any questions that investors have at IR uh, at gamesquare.com. Thanks very much. Swamio Media is a gaming and esports technology company. We deliver a software as a service solution to telecom operators around the world and enable them to reach and monetize the gaming generation, the younger generation, millennials, and the digital natives. Using our technology platform, telecom operators deliver an amazing gamer engagement solution with live streaming capabilities. And they host daily events such as challenges and tournaments where gamers can participate and have fun and earn points. With the points they earn, gamers can buy in-game items in our platform store. On top of that, using our patent pending technologies, Telecom operators can deliver the ultimate ultra low latency gaming experience to their subscribers. For this service, telecom operators charge somewhere around $5 to $8 per user per month. Swami gets around 40% of that revenue stream, somewhere between $2 to $3 per gamer per month. We are targeting the region with the largest gaming population in the world. Two billion gamers, Latin, Asia, Africa, and Middle East. With our patent pending gaming technologies, we are bringing the gaming population, the telecom operators, and the game developers together to build and deliver the largest and the best gaming platform in the world. Hi, my name is Shafin Diamond Tajani, and I'm the CEO of Victory Square Technologies, ticker VST on the CSC. Uh, we were created in 2017, uh, basically to give investors early ground floor access to a diverse portfolio uh, that currently has about 20 companies in key sectors such as gaming, uh, esports, crypto, augmented and virtual reality, cybersecurity, uh, and cloud computing. We basically give investors access to the next generation of tech giants before they're giants. Tech is borderless. So this portfolio comes from some of the top incubators from around the world, from Delhi, India, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Berlin, Germany, Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, we've basically formed some of the top minds, um, not only in the esports and gaming sector, but just in a variety of other sectors that, that we believe kind of touch um, that, uh, that area and sector. Um, within our portfolio, there are about 10 that have specific exposure and direct exposure to esports and gaming. Um, so we've looked at kind of different picks and shovels within the you know, gaming ecosystem. So from betting and fantasy game development, uh, tech around platforms, infrastructure, marketplaces, uh, arenas, and, and advertising and sponsorship. Some examples of, of those companies would be Fans Unite, which is, which is also publicly traded on the, the, the CSC under ticker FANS. Uh, Game On Entertainment Technologies, again, under the ticker GET on the CSC. Uh, immersive Tech, Next Key Centrum, Shape Immersive. I mean, the list goes on. We've kind of looked at, you know, some of the brightest minds uh, working in this space and sector. 
specifically for our company, like I mentioned, we give investors access to a diverse portfolio. So it's not a one trick pony. Um, you know, there's, there's 20 chances to kind of knock it out of the park uh, with one, one share, one ticket of BSD. We've got a very healthy balance sheet. We've had five consecutive quarters of positive net income and earnings per share. Uh, we've issued a share dividend out earlier in 2021. Um, our most recent audited financials we reported, which was for 2020, uh, we recorded $16.3 million of, of positive net income and earnings per share of about 30 cents. So, uh, you know, sector wise, we think this space has tremendous room to grow. Uh, we've, you know, we've got 10 specifically in that space that we think are going to be uh, home runs. And we feel the entry point for investors to, to, to get exposure to the space through VST is super attractive. So, yeah, excited, uh, you know, excited for investors to, to, to you know, to, to ride this roller coaster with us. Thanks very much for having me today. My name is John Dwyer. I'm the CEO and chairman of Wonder Gaming, which is very proudly listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. At Wonder Gaming, we view the landscape of esports and conventional sports as being one that is intersecting more and more every day. And as such, we've harnessed the NFT non-fungible token arena through our acquisition of EGI and the launch of our uh, NFT indices and NFT marketplace, which is memestation.com, um, as an opportunity to bring gamers and athletes together under one roof and integrate the gaming community across the globe with the brands that are most important to them. And in that experience as well, we're also harnessing loyalty and rewards, which we find is a very meaningful tool to help the game, the gaming ecosystem liaise with the brands that are most important to them and achieve savings. We think that creative content with amazing companies like Reddit, and Twitch, is really where the future lies as it relates to how to access the gaming community and provide them with content and again, access to very unique uh, uh, opportunities to purchase products like brand new sneakers that are incredibly important to all things gaming or new gaming console hardware or even products that are non-endemic like opportunities to open your first checking account, have an opportunity to get interest rate bearing credit cards and things of that nature that throughout the lifeline of a, of a gamer, whether it's a 12 year old, an 18 year old, a 28 year old and beyond, this industry provides a very unique opportunity for companies like ours to bring brands into the ecosystem in an authentic way to help the gaming community achieve the kind of deals that they deserve and help the brands understand exactly who they're selling to. So we achieve that through our NFT platform. We achieve that through our, uh, our loyalty and rewards platform, which is gonna be launched just after Labor Day, uh, which is called gamingawards.com. And we're incredibly bullish on all things esports. I think our community at large thanks to some of the great leaders, many of which, by the way, have come out of Canada in the space. Um, we're, we're emerging out of an industry that has been diagnosed as nascent, right? We're now something that is being viewed as a group of companies in their own individual silos that are accessing 2 billion plus people across the planet every day that are playing video games. And at the end of the day, what works in this industry, in our opinion, are businesses that strive every day to have an authentic engagement with the gamer to provide them with great deals on products that they're already buying, but also to be on the cutting edge of new innovation and to provide unique opportunities uh, for them to interact with athletes, gamers, professional esports teams, professional sports teams, and as well as musicians. And you're gonna to continue to see a lot of that coming from our individual silos uh, in NFT uh, and our gaming loyalty and rewards program. So we're very excited um, and, and we're just delighted to be on the CSC. It's provided us a huge opportunity, um, you know, in the capital markets to find the style of investors that are very bullish on the future of esports. Uh, and we're just delighted to be at the, at what we believe the center of it. Um, and, and we think that Canada is going to continue to provide uh, a very strong and lucrative marketplace 
that punches well above its weight as it relates to esports and gaming. All right, welcome everyone for the CSE's esports in the capital markets uh, panel discussion. We've got a great program. We're going to talk about some great issues um, regarding esports and gaming. And really, I think we should talk about definitions as well for everyone. So, uh, very excited that we have uh, three amazing CEOs who have companies, esports and gaming companies, that are currently listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, Matthew Schmidt. Uh, Kevin Wright and Matt Bailey, you guys want to wave? Welcome, everyone. Great to hey, have thanks you. Thanks for here. having us, Dan. No uh, why don't we just go around? Um, I'd love for you guys maybe just give a quick introduction, uh, who you are, your company, and then we'll get right into it. So, um, Matthew Schmidt, you want to kick things off? Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us, Dan, and excited to be here chatting with all these great minds. Um, so, I'm the CEO of Alpha Esports Tech. Our ticker is ALPA. Um, in a nutshell, we really focus on amateur and emerging gamers. Our core platform is a platform called Gamers Arena, spelled with a Z. Um, my background, I come from film and media and entertainment, and um, I'm having a lot of fun kind of connecting the dots between brands and organizations that want to reach younger demographics and kind of meet them where they already are. And it's been really exciting to be in a space that's evolving and changing so quickly. It's growing rapidly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're learning a lot and having a lot of fun building as we go. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm going to go, uh, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Ben. How you doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin Wright. I'm the president of uh, Game Square Esports with GSQ on the CSE. Uh, we are effectively a digital media company. So we're, we're doing the connecting of brands and fans. Uh, through digital uh, media groups, through a talent agency that we operate in the UK, and we just recently acquired Complexity Gaming uh, in uh, in Texas, uh, which is a massive uh, media collection and and top tier teams uh, that uh, that reach all around the world. Awesome, thank you so much. And finally, Matt Bailey. Hey guys, I'm I'm Matt Bailey, CEO of Game On Entertainment Technology. Just recently listed on the CSE about month ago under the ticker G-E-T. Uh, and we work with content providers, so that's teams, leagues, TV networks, work sports books and esports organizations, and make their content more engaging and social through predictive gaming. So we're a white label platform that programmatically creates predictive gaming experiences around our partners' content. Awesome, thanks so much. Uh, I get the feeling, do you, have, do you guys already know each other? Have you guys chatted before? Uh, no, right. no not yet. No, this is the first time because, like, as you guys are telling me about your companies, like, I, I'm already hearing so many synergies. So, at the very least, this is awesome uh, for no other reason that you guys should get together and talk and chat. Um, does someone want to take a stab at when we talk about just definitions and understanding the terms? There's esports, which is well, I'll let you guys define it, and there's gaming, which you know, gaming does include a lot of things. Um, can you? Give a good definition for the everyday investor and what the difference is between the two. Well, for me, I, I mean, you know, I really look at gaming as the macro industry and esports as one silo of that. And, you know, for a while we saw it being a, a popular kind of buzzword in, in investing um, because it felt new to a lot of people when you saw these big stadiums, even pre COVID, get sold out for these events. But these um, communities had been percolating on the fringes for some time now, and, and it was cool to see it come to light. But as an industry, there's so many other verticals, just like if you were to say, you know, media or music or film, there's so many other different verticals um, within there and, and competitive gaming, not just for pros, but um, online and more lifestyle gamers. So I really describe it as esports being one vertical of competitive high stakes gaming within the gaming industry as a whole. I don't know if you guys would add to that, Kevin or Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from my standpoint, we're, we're a B2B uh, organization and we're primarily looking at, at we're servicing the, the B2B space and, and partners. Uh, I think, yeah, gaming is, is overall the category that, that we're going after, one of the categories and verticals that we're servicing and, and esports is, is one of them under that. Uh, and then outside of that, we're in traditional sports and other parts, uh, other categories as well. But yeah, I agree with with Matthew and what he said, and I, I see it as overall gaming and esports being one of them. Yeah, and I, I think esports is, is shifting and evolving in and itself too. Um, 
uh, which is interesting, just from you know these pro player pro players, if you will, um, and then now what we're seeing is a lot of lifestyle players that are that are, it takes the same amount of time. They're streaming so much, um, and we're seeing a lot of pro players. You're gonna have to pick one or the other, but you know even players like Ninja or, or these other players are shifting to being lifestyle players. They're still making a living. They're working with brands and sponsors instead of playing these large um, um, high stakes tournaments with bigger prize pools. And the lifestyle gamers, if you will, it kind of reminds me a lot of just influencers, which we've seen across other industries and, and other digital platforms. Um, but the influence they're having and the engagement of these fans watching them is unprecedented for me. Um, and, and I feel like it's just getting started. Yeah, and, and another thing is we, I, I, what I mentioned is I kind of bucketed sports outside in a different category, but we're actually seeing them blend together as well. Uh, traditional sports with esports. And what we used to call an athlete is changing as well uh, because totally. these esports uh, competitors, they are athletes. Um, totally. Mentally. Totally. So yeah. I, uh, the question was kind of asking to, to clearly kind of define the two, but they're actually, they actually blend over quite a bit um, and we're probably going to see more of an evolution over the coming years. Yeah, totally. Kevin, Kevin I want to ask you, um, you know, when Forbes values sports franchises, they include things like ticket sales, merchandise, and things like that. From what I've looked at with, with New Zoo stats, when they're valuing and deciding on esports revenue, they're le leaving out merch and a, a lot of sort of ancillary items that, let's say, for complexity, is only driven because of their esports. So do you feel kind of the esports industry and that $1 billion number that's thrown around doesn't really reflect um, some of the other sources of revenue that, yes, maybe are not direct, but are clearly part of the picture? Yeah, they, they have to be part of the picture. And, and so when we look at complexity, what we like is they're a, they're a top tier world-class uh, org. Uh, their CSGO team is top 10 in the world. Um, and what that does is it gives them the credibility, the, the, the respect of fans in the industry. Um, that drives, I mean, one, an ability to create a ton of content. And they're, they're about to, uh, to kick off the Race to World First event, uh, which is, you know, two weeks of uh, content created by complexity, it's gonna do more than the Overwatch League did across all the teams uh, in an entire season. And so it's building that content, which then is attracting the eyeballs. And then it's all the pieces around that. It's branded content that you can create for sponsors. It's the merchandise that you can create. Yeah, it's the events that you run. It's, uh, it's, it's the sponsorships. It's, it's this whole ecosystem of pieces that are available. And I think that's what's interesting with esports is that we're entering this era of professionalization where it's moving mm -hmm. from just being a uh, top tier team, uh, really focusing on training those athletes like Matt talked about into how do we actually monetize this now and how do we take this great content and, and drive those dollars uh, into the esports uh, uh, industry? Totally. Awesome. And, and I look at it as like, where does that content live? And, and at times it can feel really fragmented, but it's kind of finding itself. And there's a great roadmap from conventional sports and looking at that. And that was a really interesting question, Ben. But it's also different in a sense that like, if you look at, um, you know, nobody owns football, but the NFL is the most reputable league. Whereas in esports, we have these publishers who own the IP of the game, um, which in and itself is a little different when those macro numbers are thrown around. Um, but I, but I still think there's so many different parallels to just video games being the new social media and, and how we're now connecting with Gen X, Y, and Z, um, is, is really interesting. Yeah, no, thanks. So in conclusion, it's complicated. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to transition for a second. It's, I'm glad you brought up, you know, monetization and revenue. Um, can you guys go through within your own companies, you know, and, and again, try to break it down for the simple investor. Um, you know, how do you guys make money uh, personally as a company and, and maybe talk about what those verticals are? Uh, maybe we'll start with Matt, uh, Matt Bailey. Yeah, yeah. So we, we given, again, we're B2B uh, and we're providing, you know, technology solutions to our partners. Uh, we have two two uh, revenue streams or a two prong monetization model. The first is licensing revenue, so you know it's similar to a SaaS fee, it's recurring revenue. Uh, they pay to license our technology, and then the second is a uh, revenue share. So all of the things we mentioned uh, or what were just mentioned, so sponsorships, maybe programmatic ad revenue, 
the sales of uh, merchandise or collectibles or NFTs or, or whatever it might be. Um, if our partner is doing that by our technology, we'll participate in sharing that upside as well. So there are two ways that, that we generate revenue. Awesome. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, Kevin, what about you? Yeah. So uh, like I said, we, we operate digital uh, media group. We uh, operate a talent agency. Both of those are similar. We, we sit in between the brands and the big esports audience. So we're, we're uh, connecting up influencers in the UK uh, with brands who then authentically uh, uh, showcase those products and services to, to the people that follow them. Uh, we take care of all the business needs for those influencers from the legal side, collections, uh, reporting for the, uh, uh, for the advertisers. And we've got a really healthy consulting business there. On this side of the Atlantic, uh, we have a digital media group uh, that you know, provides bespoke activations for, uh, for brands that are trying to figure out how do we reach uh, this, this massive, growing, important demographic that likes esports. So again, we're getting paid for the IP of how to create these activations. And then when we move over to the complexity side of uh, owning an esports org, you know, there the way that we monetize is you know, branded sponsorships for uh, uh, one, the facilities that we operate in, it's logos on the, uh, uh, on the jerseys, but more importantly, it's you know, how do we connect up brands with really interesting content uh, creation? Uh, and then that extends to the agency of record agreement that we have with the Dallas Cowboys for their gaming and esports. And so it's helping them understand how do we connect up this massive esports audience to conventional and traditional sports. Uh, because there are a lot of people that uh, can be interested in the NFL that just might not be there yet. And our job is to bring those eyeballs. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I'm definitely hearing, and, and you know, sponsorship being, you know, last I've heard 60, 70% of the industry. So it seems uh, like that's, that's holding true. And uh, Matthew, what about you? What about your company? Yeah, totally. So <clears throat> our core asset, Gamers Arena, that I talked about, focuses on amateur and emerging gamers and it's a cross-platform tournament. So it doesn't matter what title you're playing or what, um, you know, if you're playing on an Xbox, PS5, your PC, you're going to meet and connect with different players and compete in tournaments for prize pools. And again, like, you know, looking at the numbers, over 2.7 billion people are playing video games and 75,000 pro players. So there's this whole other segment of people that want to compete uh, competitively and, and meet each other and kind of find those communities and scrim. So the, the tech itself, we can onboard a bunch of people, whether it's a bracket or a leaderboard format, and administer different prizes throughout that. So there's a few different revenue verticals in there. Uh, one of the main ones is a monthly subscription service. For this, players are getting access to bigger and better uh, prizing and tournaments. They're getting stats and analytics, which kind of leads to coaching and scouting. And we're doing a lot of stuff with up-and-coming schools and a kind of discovery engine with colleges and universities, which is a very big fragmented part of our industry right now. So the monthly subscription is it's how we're buying movies right now. It's how we're buying music. Um, uh, we really like that that model there. Skill-based challenges is another big one that we're working on right now. So this is just head-to-head, peer-to-peer skill-based challenges. So Ben, if you and I challenge each other to a game and I wagered you $10, winner takes nine, house takes a 10% clip, which is very similar to a company called Skills, S-K-I-L-L-Z. Um, and then also our B2B stuff. So the same tech we have to onboard a vast amount of users and organize these different tournaments, but also to spit out the information on there, to give them one unique dashboard. Brands and organizations are really interested in this. And for me, this is a very fast way to drive user growth. It's through these larger partnerships with organizations, companies, professional sports teams that we're already working with, and colleges and universities, and kind of becoming the gold standard of amateur and emerging gamers and ranking. But these are also services that these brands and organizations will pay for monthly and what we're calling gas, just to play on SaaS, gaming as a service, um, to really give them staff and analytics on their user base. Because you know the, the smarter organizations are paying attention and they want to meet their younger fan base where they're already spending their time and it's gaming, it's here. Right. Um, so giving them their own social communities and rather than us really have to, to, to build up and drive the Gamers Arena brand, which we're already doing and it's growing organically and we're really happy with that, white labeling that, to have these other large, like globally recognized brands and to power their esports organizations online and their social communities. 
Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I hope that, you know, kind of summarizes some of the, you know, revenue streams, whether it's, you know, a B2B SaaS model, whether it's a B2C subscription model, uh, or whether it's brand partnerships, there's many different ways, you know, for people to monetize within this industry. Um, to switch gears for a second, you know, you guys are part of a pretty uh, elite and exclusive club. There's only maybe 20 esports and gaming companies, not including game developers game developers or publishers that are publicly traded in North America. So really people look to you guys in terms of the trends, what's going to be big, what's, you know, what's happening next. So I um, want to know, what do you guys think? Maybe just if you could say two parts, and again, just really quickly, um, where does, where do you as a company want to go? Uh, let's say in the next 12 months uh, and maybe some more macro trends of where do you think the industry going? I know that's a really broad question, but I want to leave it to you guys to, to give me your impact. Um, your input. So, uh, Matthew, maybe we'll start with you. Bailey? Matthew Schmidt. Or, or, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have totally, Matt yeah. and Matthew. That's how I'm making yeah. the. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a great question. I, you know, I, I've always felt coming into this industry as as the you know the technology is like a decade ahead of everything else that we're seeing, but I've always felt like the branding and the biz dev is a decade behind, and it's still kind of playing catch up. And the way these brands are integrating with these communities. Um, you know, looking at Gen Z's right now, they're going to account for 40% of the global consuming this year, spending power of over $150 billion, you know, eight to 24 year olds. The way these people communicate, shop, share, connect, and find these communities, um, they're very obsessed with authentic and transparent experiences. So I think the way brands interact with them is changing and the smart ones are paying attention. So rather than just a logo or a pop-up ad, or I have to watch this for this many seconds till I can skip, it, instead of annoying them, we're really trying to look at finding ways where we can add value back to them and they get something from that. So, you know, I think the, where the industry is going with how brands add value back to the gamers and the end users, um, I think that's going to be a big trend. Just offering those kind of customized interactive brand experiences, as well as commercial placements, but placements that make sense and are authentic to, to the gaming experience. And then the data and analytics and, and sponsorship evaluations within that. Um, and also big trends that we're paying close attention to is mobile. Um, we got a lot of stuff in the pipeline with mobile and um, uh, AR mobile working with existing brand IP. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're a young company. We've only been listed for about three months, but we're looking at some really exciting M&A opportunities. To, to drive user growth and find things that can kind of cross pollinate value amongst the, the portfolio and team is, is really what we're focused on is, is just bringing together great minds from other industries, as well as this industry to kind of solve these problems and, and offer these communities great experiences. Awesome. Appreciate that. Great insight um, for, the, for this coming year. Um, let's take it to Kevin. What about you guys? What's next for you in the next 12 months and, and the industry? Yeah, so for us, it's continuing to build up the relationships uh, with brands that are trying to enter into uh, esports, and and exactly what Matthew just talked about, it's the it's it's that authenticity uh, for brands and and how do they reach them? And so we're partnering up with uh, uh, with insights. We're partnering up with technology solutions. So a really creative, innovative uh, solution that we partnered up recently. Uh, it monitors what people are saying about brands. And so it's it's really taking that understanding and helping brands to, to know what's being said about them and how to uh, uh, customize your message for that. And, you know, it comes to brand safety, it comes to awareness, and it's it's all these things that brands are expecting from other industries, but aren't necessarily getting within esports. And so, you know, the the biz dev and, and marketing side catching up, I think that that really resonates. Uh, and then for us more broadly, I mean, yeah, we're chasing after uh, brands that are in the market and convincing new ones to come in. But we think on the macro side, more and more brands are spending more and more money because they're seeing good ROI come out of these. Um, and I also think that the the, the M&A uh, trend is going to continue. So, you know, we're, we're trending towards $28 million in revenue for 2022. Uh, and you know, a good chunk of that's built on the M&A that we've done. Uh, with a lot of uh, organic growth. I think there's so much opportunity coming for consolidation within this industry, uh, where it's Agreed. smart uh, smart acquisitions that are not just on the revenue side, but really driving towards uh, the cash flow generation in the, uh, in, the, in the coming months. 
Nice. Yeah, I noticed when you put that out, it's very rare that esports companies um, put out kind of any type of forward guidance. So um, I thought that was really, really, I'm going to say ballsy that you guys did that. Um, but I think it sets the right, right expectation. Like there should be a little bit more continuity uh, for investors looking at different companies. We're drawing a line in the sand, uh, showing how we have that build up with our portfolio companies. Uh, and we're not forecasting out like, you know, triple digit growth. These are, these are low to mid double digit growth for, uh, for our portfolio companies. And I think that's really achievable within esports. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. Uh, Matt Bailey, what about you guys? What's next for you and uh, some of the trends? I think what's, what's really important and the trend that we're going to see, or we are seeing to an extent now uh, in gaming, especially in esports and sports betting, where the, where there are these kind of, um, passionate audiences, but they're quite niche, but they're looking to expand to, and become more mainstream. I think education is going to be really important. So products that don't just expect the North American audience to understand and be able to make a bet or be able to, you know, play, play esports, but actually it helps them in becoming educated to do so. I think that's going to be really important. We're trying to help our partners do that uh, on the predictive gaming side. And then uh, the other that, that we're really focused on is innovation. So again, using predictive gaming as an example, we don't want to just keep pushing out, you know, turnkey, uh, you know, predict prediction games and just stop at that. We want to be innovative in what we're serving to our partners. And an example is we just announced an NFT predictor uh, where you're using collectibles as pieces, as a utility in a prediction game. And we're taking that to our partners like teams, leagues, TV networks, tournaments, um, and it's being responded to really well. Um, we're not a blockchain company. We're not an NFT company. We're just gamifying that. Um, and that's an example of what we'll continue doing is coming up with innovative products that are first of its kind that haven't been done before, um, kind of taking big swings at, at spaces and products that haven't been pushed out before. So that's what we'll be focusing on. And then I'll, I'll double down on what Matthew said with team. I think teams, everything. Um, Game On continues to, to hire and, and expand our team in key leadership roles that are going to help us expand, drive partnerships and drive revenue. Uh, I got excited for a second. I thought you were going to say, I'm going to double down and give you our 2020 revenue forecasts as well. <laughs> uh, but no, it's all good. Um, just to kind of wear the investor hat a little bit, you know, there is, and I think, I think we'd probably agree, there's a lot of volatility in, you know, for esports companies that are publicly traded. Could be that a lot of them are small caps, could be because of COVID. Um, what are kind of some of the risk factors um, that you guys could identify for investors who are thinking, I want to get into esports and gaming, I want to have it as part of my portfolio, but I'm not the type of investor that's, you know, shooting for the moon uh, and, and, and swinging for a home run. So uh, maybe you can just lay out a couple couple risk factors, risk, risk factors you think investors should look at. Um, Kevin, why don't you start us off? To, to me, I think what people need to look at is what's the quality of the revenue and what's the long-term uh, uh, profitability uh, and, and how do companies get to it? And so uh, I think there's a lot of companies right now on, on big, juicy uh, sales multiples. Uh, but, you know, at some point that needs to turn into cash flow. And, and you know, for, for both the guys that are on this call, they're, they're tech platforms. So there's lots of runway. Uh, to sort of own the world as you uh, as you add those uh, those customers, but I think you know non tech based uh, companies that don't have a path to profitability. I, I think that's a risk that investors need to really understand is uh, how is this company going to be a cash flowing company that's worth a lot in you know whether it's three years or five years or ten years. We need to see that path. Yeah, that. and and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's one single publicly traded esports or gaming company again not including game publishers that's eat that that's got positive EBITDA right yeah I, unless I don't you think, can think of one that I can't yeah I don't I don't think there are uh, and that's why we keep uh, we keep drilling in that on the M&A pipeline that we're doing we continue to look at companies that are operating in that you know 20 to 50 percent EBITDA margin as a uh, as a way to accelerate getting to that profitability yeah awesome um, let's go to uh, Matthew Schmidt uh, what do you think some yeah, of the risk factors? I, I think, Kevin, uh, there's some really great insights there. I mean, you know, if I'm looking at it from a retail perspective, you know, I'm, I'm betting on the team uh, because because this space is, is evolving so quickly and changing so quickly. Um, and a lot of tech platforms like Game On and ourselves, um, you know, we have a lot of these blue sky elements, but but spreading it out and being able to be nimble enough to adapt and drill into what's working 
um, and and really adapt and, and focus on you know where the market's going because unlike being a publisher and making a game where these runways is, is, are so long to bring that game to market um, you know we need to be able to change on on the drop of a hat sometimes and and adapt in you know and if I look at it from you know earlier publicly traded companies a lot of them have pivoted what they originally set out to do and and there's nothing wrong with that I look at enthusiasts in the early days and what they originally were and with their team and now you know becoming more of this TSN, ESPN for, of esports, and, and you know you get these macro numbers of how many eyeballs and this, and I think it's really great for the space. But when I look at these smaller, younger ones, I really think, okay, who's the team? You know, what have they worked on, and do they have some really good guidance there to, to kind of you know you know? And, and I've been really lucky to have our, our chairman Jonathan Anastas, who's been a great kind of guiding force on, on that side for me, and kind of balance stuff out. Um, he was a global head of, of digital at Activision. You know, that company saw a 10x of value over his tenure. He's now the CMO of One Esports. They've raised over 400 million bucks, over a billion dollar market cap. And, you know, the conversations I have with him are really, what are the trends? Where is this space going? And, and what has the most white space for us? And then through M&A and, um, you know, purchasing other bits of technology and teams, can we get exposure to these spaces? And then we're going to see where that goes and, and what works there. So, I mean, in a nutshell, um, you know, if it's a smaller company, I'm looking at the team. Uh, if it's a larger company, I'm, I'm drilling down on actual active users and, and revenue and EBITDA and fundamental. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, and let's, uh, yeah, Matt Bailey, some final um, thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean, the risk that, that I would look at if, if I was an investor, I still think um, COVID is still a risk. In North America, we're looking better, but, you know, Australia just went into lockdown. Um, Japan, no, no one's going to the, the Olympics. India is still doing it pretty tough. So from a sports standpoint, I think there's still that risk of, of certain, especially traditional sports, not, not happening. We've tried to mitigate against that through not just helping our partners in sports, but also reality, TV, news, elections. We worked with NBC Universal and Bravo late last year on a prediction game for the Real Housewives. And that's now a significant part of our business. So that's how we've mitigated it. What, to what Matthew said, be nimble and, and actually ride the wave and go where the opportunities you know, might be presenting themselves. Um, so so that's, that's the main one uh, that I would point out. Uh, but yeah, again, I think you know, you're, you're betting on, with these small companies, you're betting on team, you're betting on the people around them that are helping drive the business each and every day. Awesome. So, uh, you know, just just some final thoughts, you know, because this is about, you know, esports and the capital markets. Um, there's been a lot of companies, even the past couple months that have gone public, whether it's, you know, Wonder Gaming. And I think you guys, right? Game On, you were the last one, most recent, the newest kid on the block. Um, Overactive Media is, is trading on Thursday. And, you know, there's a big pipeline of others coming. Um, do you still see... Um, is this just still a good time for raising capital um, or is there a bit of a correction in valuations um, from just your own experiences running your companies and raising money? Uh, where would you kind of rate the market in terms of um, raising capital and valuations? Um, Kevin, you can kick things off. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in because we, we just uh, completed a, a raise. We haven't even closed it yet, but uh, you know, we did two private placements. One was the, the Jerry Jones uh, family office uh, from the Dallas Cowboys and the Goss put in seven and a, seven million US or eight and a half uh, Canadian as part of the complexity deal. But then on top of that, we raised another eight and a half uh, million uh, Canadian among institutions in, uh, in Canada. And so, you know, it, it wasn't easy, but uh, I think we, we got pretty good support. Uh, there's always some volatility, always going to a raise, a little worried about how it's going to go. But we were we were fully subscribed on a on a bot deal before before it was even announced. So I think it's still healthy. Um, I think that there are still a number of companies that will come to market, and I think that investors are starting to wrap their head around this is an investable space, and so they're willing to make kind of small bets in companies uh, that are up and coming, give them a little bit of runway to uh, to do their thing, show what they're doing, uh, and then I think we've been we've been fortunate because now we're able to talk about you know, the, the, the outlook that we have. And so we're making that migration from large retail investors to, you know, the, that important uh, institutional side. So I was really pleased that more institutions are, are paying attention. And I think that's also off the back of a really successful story and enthusiast, um, which I think is uh, totally. 
is a, is a great bellwether for all of us uh, to point totally. to uh, what can companies become in this space. Totally. Well said, and congrats on that raise, Kevin. Um, yeah, you know, just to add to that, I think Enthusiast has been a great kind of leader of the pack, and, and I think a lot of um, institutions and family offices are tar starting to take the space more serious. Um, you know, we, we did our, our private placement raise before we went public. We were oversubscribed. It, it went really well for us. And I, what I found is a lot of people just wanted exposure to the space, and they didn't fully understand it yet. And, and you know, we really invited them to just look at the team, look at, look at what we're attacking in the white space. Um, and you know, we're, I feel like we're just getting warmed up and, uh, and looking forward to building it out. Awesome. Yeah, and to, to wrap that up, I, I agree. Um, we also did a pre pre IPO private placement went really well, closed it, you know, within a week or so. Uh, and I can speak more to like predictive gaming and sports betting. Uh, like we're hundred percent just in the first innings with that in North America. There, there aren't many opportunities in a lifetime where you can say North America will be the biggest market for this without a doubt because it's uh, just yeah, it hasn't been legal there's been some regulatory hurdles which that's a that's another risk uh, to keep in mind like the regulatory landscape could play a part um, but yeah we're just in the first innings for, for predictive gaming and sports betting in the US and you can see that oh, sorry North America and you can see that from you know the the roll ups and the the acquisitions and the the financings that are happening you know almost on a daily basis I'm seeing that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation for sure. Yeah, if we had more time, I'd love to also talk about M and A. That's a really huge part of the industry as well. Uh, I feel like every day there's a new ac no, not I don't think there is every day there's a new acquisition. Um, Definitely. So um, that was awesome, guys. I really appreciate that. I think I think you guys gave you know everyone watching a pretty good uh, grasp of what's going on in the industry, some of the trends and things like that. Uh, maybe just end off um, kind of where people can get a hold of you, how to find you, and uh, your stock ticker. Okay. Yeah. So again, our company is Alpha Esports Tech. Our ticker is A L P A on the Canadian Exchange. Uh, myself, Matthew D. Schmidt on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to following uh, these guys. It's been great chatting with you, Kevin and Matt. And uh, hopefully, you guys keep an eye on us, and we got some really exciting stuff in the pipeline. Thanks a lot, Matt uh, Bailey. Yeah, Matt Bailey, CEO at, at Game On Entertainment Technologies. Ticker is GET. Um, you know, reach out to me anytime, Matt at GameOn.app, app, or check out our website, GameOn.app. Right. And Kevin Wright. Yeah, uh, Kevin Wright, president of GameSquare. So uh, tickers, GSQ on the uh, Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, on social, we're, I think, across the board, GSQ Esports. Uh, so you can find us there. And then uh, reach out to us at ir at uh, gamesquare.com, uh, and we will promptly reply. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm Ben Pfefferman. Um, moderating this panel uh, from Amuka Esports. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. I also want to thank uh, Philip Schum and everyone from the CSC for putting together this great event. I think the more we can educate investors, uh, the better it is for the industry. So thank you so much for that. And um, hope everyone enjoyed the program. Hi, I'm Trevor Erickson, CEO of ePlay Digital. All right, a lot of herself there. Uh, Phil, how you doing, man? That was great. Uh, that was a really <laughs> insightful uh, panel. Um, there were a whole bunch of information about uh, trends, um, you know, risk, and then uh, you know the definition between esports as well as gaming. So uh, I'm, I was very happy with that. Yeah, no, very insightful. I, I guess my my general sense of what's happening in the industry is that we're still pretty early stage. Obviously, uh, we first did uh, esports in the capital markets forum. Uh, now three years ago, uh, and and just the the understanding and the business models are far more refined. It seems uh, mm -hmm. you know back then people were just trying to put together teams or sponsor organizations that were cultivating talent in the space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to attract brands, but not necessarily sure how to bring them into the, the ecosystem. Whether it was through arena sponsorships, team sponsorships, um, you know, buying airtime during streams. I mean, there was there's so many different ways you can. Uh, approach this industry from a, uh, from a modeling perspective. So I'll just say like, 
uh, you, you brought it home with the stats at the beginning, which is there's just a growing giant audience and they're obviously going to want to, uh, you know, interact with these, these service providers, these producers of content. And there's just going to be a phenomenal amount of ways to, to interact. You know, some people love the technology backend side, as we saw with two of those companies. The other side is obviously on the talent and the sponsorship and the curation and, and uh, connectivity of all that. So it's, yeah, it's huge. It's a big industry. Um, now, Phil, we're, we're looking forward to the second half of this program, which is going to be on betting. And, um, you know, we, we brought, uh, uh, you know, Cam McDonald forward to, to talk a bit about this. And we also have a great panel. But, yeah, any thoughts on uh, just generally sports betting and, and gaming? And, you know, I, I, I always like to hold stuff up like this. Like, this is where I came in, you know, one of these guys. This is... <laughs> Did you ever imagine that we'd be at this stage of the game, uh, no. you know, being able to do single sports betting on esports? Well, actually, I mean, I, I, I have a bit of an experience with uh, with gaming going back about 20 years working for a company called ATI Technologies. And years ago, we um, we had sponsored uh, various games or various teams, but they were land games back then. Uh, so you'd bring your own rig, you get together in a large group and then respectively compete. Um Things have advanced exponentially. It's more than just the gaming. There's the media side. There's the uh, streaming side. Sponsorship dollars are getting thrown in. Uh, people are now, of course, even developing um, uh, esports stadiums. There's a large one coming up in Toronto, and there, I, I believe there's one in uh, uh, in uh, Vancouver already set up. So, uh, so it, it, we're just going to get larger and larger, and it's it's extremely exciting. Yeah. So if you if you can't play the games, like I said, if you started off with a Nintendo controller, there's a good chance you're not good <laughs> enough to play and make money, uh, you know, in League of Legends or Dota or any of these uh, competitive gaming platforms. But certainly there's opportunity to make money if you want to gamble. And uh, that's that's what the next set of our show is going to be about. So uh, here we go. Without further ado, we're going to bring on uh, Meet the Players. First and foremost, let's meet the players. And then we'll have some great uh, content first from Cam McDonald and then our panel uh, hosted by Shad Dales of the Dales Report. So here we go. CEO of ePlay Digital. ePlay has built games for ESPN, Sony Pictures, Intel, Time Warner Cable, and others. Games for sports and TV shows. We've also built games with seven-time NBA champion Robert Ory, Olympic decathlete Dick Smith, and comedian and producer Howie Mandel. Two worlds, or sets of games, uh, and you'll understand why I'm calling them worlds as I, as I describe these things. We launched our marketing for in April 2021, just a couple months ago, and two more are in development and testing. The first two that have launched are Howie's World, or Howie'sGames.com, and Rob Ori's World, Big Shot. One's based on basketball, the other's based on Howie's germophobia. The two worlds that we haven't launched yet are called Clocked and Fan Freak, and I'll talk about each of those uh, as well. Each world has games, live events, broadcasts, gambling, fashion, celebrity, advertising, big brands, stats, augmented reality, all the stuff you imagine from sports and esports, NFTs, media, and digital and physical merch. Clock is another world we're building. It's an augmented reality fitness app and really is a network that connects sports and games you do to the sports and games you watch. And that's a really important piece for gaming and esports and where they intersect. So we have medals, trophies, prizes, friendly competitions with all these worlds, epic challenges, and brilliant moments you'll want to relive. We own the IP, ePlay does, it's very, very important. And we own that IP, including in our fourth world, Fan Freak. And Fan Freak is coming along because of new legislation in Canada, Canada related to single game sports betting. Fan Freak helps bring as much as $14 billion, according to uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, in offshore and illegal betting back into Canada. And it's our fourth world. We expect big things from that. My name is David Vinokur. I'm the CEO of Fandom Sports Media Corp. The symbol is FDM. Uh, we are building a purpose-built modular web-based platform that allows esports fans to interact with live in-game data feeds to allow them to predict what's going to be happening within esports streams. Further to that, we're also building out a wagering platform that will allow people to make predictions 
with real money attached. What we have coming down the pipeline are partnerships uh, with other wagering platforms on an affiliate basis, new modular ways for people to interact with those data streams, and various new marketing partnerships with professional teams and leagues that we're working on. Uh, over the coming six months, people will see us expanding our footprint uh, to various different uh, markets around the world on the wagering side, uh, expanding our footprint uh, to our esports team partnerships, and us also as well getting into sports wagering. Uh, we have lots of exciting developments coming down the pipeline. Uh, looking forward to keeping all of our investors posted. So thank you very much and keep an eye on Fandom Sports Media. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Scott Burton. I'm the, the CEO of Fans Unite Entertainment. Uh, we trade on the, the CSE under the symbol FANS, F-A-N-S. And we are a, a global iGaming online sports betting gambling company uh, based out of Vancouver, Canada. Operations spread out uh, basically around the world. Um, we do a lot of traditional sports betting. We do casino, but esports is really where uh, my company, which was Ascot Entertainment, that merged into Fans Unite, really got its start. Uh, we were a pioneer in the esports betting space going back to 2014. We created the first ever dedicated daily fantasy site for esports called esportspools.com. And then we set out to build uh, dedicated betting products for the esports market. Uh, we started out being the first ever licensed esports betting operator out of the Isle of Man, which is a highly regulated tier one gaming jurisdiction. Uh, we've since gone on to run our own esports betting sites uh, and move towards offering our, our platform, which we call the Chameleon Gaming Platform. So it's a, a B2B offering for other operators who want to get into the esports betting space. So while we continue to operate a few um, esports betting sites ourselves that are direct to consumer, uh, most notably VamosGG.com, which is a Brazilian focused esports site. Uh, we offer a software platform for other operators who want to get into the esports betting space. So we can do everything from the uh, risk management, the payments, the KYC, the licensing, if they don't want to get gaming licenses. And we do that around the world. So we hold uh, two licenses out of Malta. We have a Curacao license. We are in the process of obtaining our UKGC license. And then we've recently announced uh, going into the uh, US market in Colorado. Um, so we are a, a rapidly growing company. Um, esports and technology is part of our, our backbone. And we see esports as uh, being a massive piece of the online betting space going forward. So in terms of news, most uh, recently around the US and Canada around sports betting, um, Outside of that, we're seeing huge growth in esports, and we expect the same here in, in Canada and the US. And going forward, we expect in the next five to 10 years, esports betting to probably make up 10% of any real sports books betting handle. So it's a space that cannot be ignored from a, a gaming standpoint. We already know what it does for the entertainment industry bigger than movies, bigger than music, bigger than sports. Um, and that's why we're extremely bullish on the, uh, the opportunities around esports and esports betting. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's Peter Gann here, CEO and President of Royal Wins. Taking the opportunity to tell you about Royal Wins, we're, we're the world's first pure skill gaming company, Real Money, which will enable you to play hyper-casual pure skill games in return for cash and non-cash prizes. So we're very, very keen on the space. Skill gaming has been on the forefront of, of many companies for a while now, and we're looking to actually leverage off that. We actually started about um, probably four or five years ago. We went gangbusters until, you know, racing up the Apple and, and Google charts, we were asked whether we had a license to, to do real money gaming. And we subsequently got one from the Kanawake Gaming Commission. So we're on App Store, we're on the Android platforms. It's hyper casual gaming, pure skill gaming. We're looking at, um, player versus player platforms, uh, non-cash prize platforms. And one of the things that we're really keen on is entering into the esports space. That's a space that's seen growth in, in, in exponential terms. We've been speaking to Amuka Sports. I think Amuka Esports is one of the listed entities on the CSE. And um, we're speaking to some of the esports management teams. Our esports platform is going to be called Coliseum. Not only do you get to to uh, um, watch key teams play, but you also get the chance to wager against uh, 
uh, other people as to who wins who wins on the uh, platform. So between our pure skill games, our uh, tournaments platform for hyper casual games, our esports platform for for moving forward, I think we're in a really good space. Moving forward, look, there are lots of opportunities out there for for blockchain gaming, crypto currencies, and we're keen and enthusiastic about all of them. We'll be listed in by the end of the month, hopefully. And we're looking forward to, you know, more investors, more people who buy into our story and, and um, follow us on this journey. So thanks very much. Hi, we're here today with uh, Cameron McDonald from uh, BLG. He's a partner over uh, at the firm. He has a focus uh, at, in securities law and has been very much involved in uh, the esports space for the last little while. So welcome, Cameron. Thanks, Philip. Thanks to you and to the CSC for having us. We're, we're excited to be a, a part of this event today. And um, I co-chair our sports and gaming law group alongside Danny Copper, who's based at our Montreal office. And collectively, we have about 50 people across the country, across all disciplines, engaged in our sports and gaming group. So we're, um, you know, we love events like this, and we, we love to talk about uh, all the exciting things that are happening in Canada right now. So thank you for having us. All right, great. Uh, well, let's get right into it. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk about what Bill C-218 is. Right. So Bill C-218, despite its funky name, is uh, the culmination of multiple attempts dating back to 2012 to end what Canada has, uh, this long-standing prohibition this country's had on legal events, sports betting. Uh, the bill was introduced last year by Conservative MP Kevin Waugh. And what it essentially serves to do is eliminate, amend and eliminate the restrictions on the Criminal Code of Canada that um, prohibit betting on the outcome of any race or fight or single event sports event or athletic contest. So um, up until this bill being passed, we just haven't been able to do that as, uh, anywhere in the country legally. So although Canada has offered legal sports wagering for decades now, um, the Canadian Lottery Corporations have only been able to offer parlay wagering, which although it's still popular, um, as opposed to betting on a certain sport or a certain event, you're, you're betting on multiple um, events linked together, and usually you only kind of win if all of the bets come in the right way. So, um, you know, through through this prohibition that we've had for decades, um, we've seen billions of dollars being channeled to the gray market via illegal bookmaking operations and offshore online sports books. So that you know that's significant revenue that as a country we could otherwise use to fund important public priorities and and just as a i wrote down an estimate but it's it's an estimate you'll see a lot in the media these days and i think it's i think it's pretty accurate that that, that around we're losing to offshore sites and illegal bookmakers about 14 billion dollars in canada annually so you know as we're all coming out of this pandemic um the importance of getting this bill passed was was paramount and, and couldn't be understated so we're all very excited um that it, that it has been passed as i will uh, get to later uh, so what would you say is the overall market potential for single event sports betting in Canada? Well, it's it's massive. Uh, so I, I guess if, for a few things, the legalization of single event sports betting, it's going to do many things for the country. It's going to allow provinces to provide competitive sports betting offerings and unlock that gray market capital I talked about earlier. It's going to support the 180,000 plus gaming industry jobs that we have across the country. And importantly, too, it's not like people haven't been putting bets through to date through these offshore sites. They have been doing that, but they've been doing it through kind of the gray market. So getting this bill passed and getting people through the legal channels is going to offer people um, a regulated marketplace with greater consumer protections and more responsible gambling programs. So I think from a con consumer protection perspective, it's 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 very important as well. So um and, and I guess in terms of the market potential, if you look at our experience of our neighbors south of the border, in the two and a half years since the PASPA decision came out in the States, um, and, and the PASPA decision, for those who aren't familiar with it, it declared the federal prohibition on sports betting on, unconstitutional. So since that time, 26 states have either launched legal sports betting or passed legislation for legal sports betting, and it's unlocked about $20 billion in the gray market in the US sports books in such a short period of time. So if we look at what people are estimating in Canada, 
A recent report from Deloitte estimates that the market for single event sports betting could grow to nearly $28 billion in Canada over the next five years, which is nearly seven times the size of the current market. So, I mean, this, the, the potential for this sector is just massive. And it's, I think it's an exciting time for all Canadians. And it kind of reminds me of a few years ago when uh, we made the recreational use of cannabis legal federally in the country too. And that gave birth to a whole new sector. I think we're kind of standing at that same top of that mountain again with this exciting change coming. Yeah, so what would you say has happened recently and uh, what's what's the next step in uh, for the bill? Well, I, I mean, only good news to report, uh, as mentioned, uh, the MP Kevin Waugh introduced this last year, but in April 22nd of this year, the, the House of Commons passed the bill on its third reading. It then was introduced to the Senate, and on June 22nd, it was approved by the Senate on its third reading. And as recently as last night, it has uh, now received royal assent and is now law. So really the only thing that we're waiting on is the Prime Minister and his cabinet to set a date for the law to come into force. Um, so all good things are happening. I think there's a lot of excited people here, including all the major sports teams too, who will benefit from this uh, coming into law. And so from a provincial plan standpoint, how do you see that getting rolled out? Well, I, I, I don't, I can't speak to every single province yet because I think some of them are still kind of mulling it over. But I know in British Columbia and Alberta, they both announced plans to implement single event sports betting as soon as Bill C-18 218 becomes law and gets brought into force. So in British Columbia, the province will be offering sports betting through playnow.com, which is its only regulated online gaming website. In Alberta, they'll be doing something similar through uh, playalberta.com, which is its regulated gaming website. And in the Atlantic provinces, um, they've also mentioned a desire to implement single event sports betting within a few weeks of its legalization. But there they have the ALC, which governs New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland and Labrador. So they need to get um, the ALC approval from each regulatory agency in each of those provinces before it rolls out. But I, I wouldn't expect there will be much delays there. And then for those uh, for those who you know who are in Ontario or have been following what Ontario is doing, it, it, Ontario is doing something a little different from the other provinces in so far as it's going to permit private operators to come into the province and set up in its new competitive iGaming marketplace. So it's it's innovative, and we're we're all very excited by um, what Ontario is doing. Um, and of course, with Bill C two eighteen now becoming law, single event sports betting will become a major part of this new iGaming marketplace for the Ontario government. But you can now have people, you know, these offshore uh, entities or U.S. entities can come up now, register and offer single event sports betting or our gaming more generally to Ontario residents without having to go through the provincial uh, regulatory scheme. So it's uh, what, what's happening in Ontario is, is very exciting as well. And I, I think Quebec is still to be determined and, and we're watching that closely. Okay. Uh, so here's the million dollar question. Where, where do you see the intersection of new gaming regulations uh, across the esports sector? It is the million dollar question. Um, I, I think the bottom line is that we're going to see the continued kind of convergence of these two undeniable trends. And the first trend, of course, is to modernize Canada's gaming industry, much like the U.S. has been doing. And that's you know, part of that modernization involves online offerings and increased consumer choice. And you pair that, uh, and especially during the pandemic, people have been increasingly online and consuming these types of uh, forms of entertainment online. So there, we have that paired with the fact that esports just continues to grow, its popularity continues to grow. So, you know, I, I think we're only seeing convergence there. And in, you know, esports global gambling revenue, um, the last stat I looked at was set to double to US 14 billion in 2020 and has no signs of slowing down. So, you know, as a result of that, I think it's undeniable. We expect to see provincial regulators and policymakers have to have to reckon with this momentum behind the sector and um, and get on side with it. I, I, I'm not aware of any clear guidance currently in terms of how esports wagering will fit into Ontario's new competitive marketplace because that's still very much unfolding and we'll see over the course of the next few months how that all shakes down, but I, I, I would expect that we will see it fit into the overall regime given its momentum and everybody's efforts currently to modernize the gaming marketplace in this country. So I think it portends well for the future integration of esports into gaming regimes. And um, you know, I, I, we all find that integration very exciting, especially in Ontario where you're seeing this competitive marketplace open up to, uh, to private operators. I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here for people to uh, do some exciting stuff for uh, consumers in this market. All right, that's that's great. Thank you for your time, Cameron, and uh, 
uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more from uh, from BLG. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. I'm Chad Dales from TDR, The Dales Report, where we profile companies that are making waves in their ever-growing industries, including the world of esports and sports betting, where we saw a major wave to begin to develop in Canada a few weeks ago with the passing of Bill C-218, legalizing single event sports event wagering. To discuss this major change and what it may mean from a capital market standpoint, we welcome you to this portion of our event called Place Your Bets. And happy to be joined with three industry leading executives. First, let's welcome David Vinokurov, CEO of Phantom Sports Media Corp. David is an accomplished executive for more than 10, or excuse me, 12 years of extensive business and corporate development experience from a variety of industries. Most recently, Mr. Vera Kurnoff served in a management consulting role to publicly traded social commerce company, plus several fintech and blockchain enabled payment companies. Mr. Vinokurov has directly contributed to the raising of tens of millions of dollars for startup and small cap companies. David, great to have you here today. Pleasure to be here, Sean. Uh, great to have you. Our next guest is Jordan Gannat, founder and CEO of Playmaker Capital. Playmaker is a game-changing platform that sits at the nexus of sports, media, gambling, and technology that is marrying an ecosystem of sports fans across multiple channels. Prior to founding Playmaker, Mr. Gannat was Group Senior Vice President of the Stars Group, which is the parent company of Poker Stars, and Chief Commercial Officer of Fox Bet from 2018 to 2020. Mr. Gannett was also Senior VP of Strategic Business Development at Scientific Games from 2011 to 2018. Jordan was also previously named of Canada's Top 40 Under 40 honorees. Jordan, welcome to the panel. Thanks, Chad. Look forward to it. Our last guest is Scott Burton, CEO from Fans Unite. Scott is a chartered professional accountant with over 20 years of operational experience, is considered a pioneer in the esports betting industry. He co founded TedBets.com, an award winning peer to peer wagering platform, which was awarded the 2014 Game to Watch Award at Ice Totally Gaming, the leading casino and sports betting industry ex uh, exposition. Scott was the chief executive officer at Ascot Entertainment prior to its merger with Fans Unite, which trades at the CSC under the ticker symbol FANS, and has experience securing and overseeing multiple gaming licenses in several licensed jurisdictions. Scott, welcome to the panel. Thanks for having us, Chad. Yeah, so let's begin uh, with this panel. What I mentioned earlier, where we saw a major wave to begin and to develop in Canada a few weeks ago with the passing of Bill C-218, which is legalizing single event wagering. Let's start with you, Scott, with a look at the new law itself. How does it change the current sports wagering landscape in Canada? Yeah, so uh, I guess for people who, who don't know, historically um, with the federal laws here in Canada, you weren't able to bet on a single sport sporting event. So you couldn't bet for the Leafs to win. Everything had to be what's either called a, a parlay or a multiple, right? Um, which, you know, is a disadvantage for the better and, and really I think forced uh, most uh, serious Canadian bettors to look for alternatives that were offshore operators that did allow for the single event betting. So, so it's kind of a handicap to the, the government run sites here in Canada by not being able to offer that. Um, so that's the, the big change now is, you know, all the operators here in Canada that are the provincial lottery corporations uh, are going to be able to put out, a, I would say, a more competitive product uh, to the offshore operators and try and recapture a lot of that business that's gone away. So, so it's a huge shift for Can Canadian betting, and it's really the first step, I think, for, for creating a, a really competitive sports betting market uh, here in Canada. It's a big game changer for sure. So how much change can we see and how much excitement will this generate for the overall industry? I, we're seeing a lot. I mean, you saw it in, the, I think, the reaction to the markets when, as it was coming with, you know, companies like The Score, companies like ourselves, um, and, and all the provinces gearing up. So Ontario is making big moves to open up to outside operators prior to the end of this year. Um, they're already talking about having single event betting in place for the NFL, which is, you know, the biggest betting season in North America. So huge excitement and, and overall size. I mean, I think it was the CGA's estimate that there's, you know, 14 billion plus being wagers offshore right now. So a big chance to capture uh, that betting revenue and the tax revenue and create more industry here in Canada. So, you know, we've always been a Canadian based company, but 
um, never thought we could participate in the Canadian market. And this is really the first time I think there's going to be opportunities for people like us here at home. It's great. Times are changing. David, you're CEO of Fandom, which trades of the CSC under the ticker symbol FDM. Um, are you already eyeing the Canadian market now that the change has occurred? And if so, what kind of growth can we anticipate here in Canada over the next two years? Oh, well, we're definitely eyeing the market, obviously, being a Canadian company, as Scott's, you know, with our technology developed here in Canada, I think it's very important that uh, domestic companies are able to be at the forefront um, in supporting the industry and nurturing jobs in the industry and creating opportunities within Canada, expanding the tax base. Uh, so we are a part of the Canadian Gaming Association. Uh, we are closely monitoring uh, the events. As Scott said, Ontario is moving quickly to you know, be live by the end of the year. Now, you know, the definition of being live, that isn't completely transparent yet. Yep. Uh, you know, in terms of the policies, the procedures, you know, there's always a lag between the, it being legalized and then regulated and, you know, having the whole support bureaucracy set up. Um, so, you know, we're closely monitoring the situation. Uh, we're building up teams and the processes, you know, under uh, existing regimes that exist and following the best practices because, you know, ultimately it's a global industry. You know, we're yeah. waiting to see what the Canadian uh, regulators, the provincial regulators, namely, are going to do in terms of setting up the nuance within each market and, uh, you know, try to stay nimble and, and be a part of the conversation as it unfolds. Well, you mentioned taxation. It's a question for all of you, and David, we'll stick with you. Throughout de deliberations, legislators continue to reference that legalized sports betting would eliminate black market offshore betting and keep the money in country and taxable. So what are the ex expectations in reference to that? And what does that, I go, I guess, where does it sit today? And what can we expect moving forward across the country? You know, I have to be honest, I, I haven't seen any uh, numbers that I want to rely upon yet. Um, <laughs> it's still the, early, the, obviously. It, it's still early in that regard. And then, you know, uh, my experience, unless it's passed and it's written down and it's codified in paper, it, it's just speculation. Um, you know, whatever it is, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to pay it. Uh, like I said, to support industry and to support the other ancillary benefits to the local economy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's the politicians writing the laws. And then, you know, as industry participants, you know, uh, we want to have our voice heard and make sure they're as fair as possible, equitable as possible. And ultimately, I just want to make sure from from, from perspective of the CEO of fandom, you know, that, that Canadian companies have an equal, if not better, opportunity to, to have a real presence in the market as opposed to having foreign operators just swoop in and, you know, start buying up market share. Right. Jordan, you care to comment on that? Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting position, right? The, the, the reason why the governments, in particular, focus on Ontario, because they'll be the first one March 2020 when they put a law in place to open up the market to uh, international <laughs> operators, the reason they did that is to channel as much of the unregulated market into the regulated market, right. recognizing that the OLG on its own uh, with all of the foreign competition wasn't going to be able to capture. And when you take a look at how to set taxation rates, the good news is that we don't have to invent anything. There's a lot of data out there from a lot of markets, in particular in Europe and particular in Scandinavian markets, that can give some direction and some visibility into what could potentially be uh, an Ontario market with international operators competing with uh, right. government-run entities. So in Denmark, uh, Danske Spill, who actually runs the uh, is the government-run Danish lottery, the government said, Danske Spill, you're going to be able to operate here, but we're also going to allow international operators. And they set a tax rate between 15 and 20 percent, which seemed to be a reasonable tax rate and they were able to channel over 90% of the unregulated market into the tax-paying regulated market. Wow. There's two things. You know, one, one of the key things is the regulated market, of course, as we say, it's going to benefit Canadians because taxes are being repatriated. But what it also does is protect consumers. And ultimately, you regulate for two reasons. The first reason is the economic. The second, uh, and not necessarily the less or more important, but the second is to make sure that you have a healthy environment. And a healthy environment means you have rules and regulations in place to protect consumers. Uh, and I think that when we, you know, as this market begins to evolve and the AGCO begins to put out its regulations, it's going to focus on looking at those examples and to put in place things that don't set tax rates too high, then you make it uncompetitive and you yeah. have to remain competitive yeah. and don't make them too low where potentially they aren't maximizing the benefit that could be available to Ontarians and ultimately to all Canadians. Scott, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I think one of the, the key things that we'd like to see with, you know, when this comes into place is, is probably some good education around it as well, coming out of the, you know, the provincial governments. Um, I think what we've seen in some other places is that, you know, consumers hear that it's legalized now and they, they don't distinguish between regulated and unregulated sites. They just think gambling's legal. Um, or the sports betting sites are now properly run, and that's not always the case. So unless the government, I think, does some some additional education around it for the consumers, um, but also some enforcement. I think Canada's got a history of zero enforcement when it comes to offshore operators, and um, you know I think there, there's going to need to be a combination of things to protect consumers, which is ultimately you know one of the best benefits out of regulation. Um, but then to make sure that, you know, people who do come in, uh, follow the rules, go through the regulatory process, um, you know, can, can be competitive. So, so that's our thing. I think there's definitely going to be a tax benefit. We know that um, there's definitely going to be a bunch of revenue coming back to the provinces. Um, but unless they also work on the other side, which is the education and enforcement, um, you know, there'll be some challenges. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Jordan, the province of Ontario is expected to be a first mover when it comes to offering competitive marketplace for single sports wagering. Do you agree with that? And if so, does it in any way suggest that U.S. operators will find it easy to obtain a license here? Yeah, so the, as I mentioned earlier, March 20th uh, budget um, or the March 20 budget put in place the framework for Ontario to open up the marketplace to uh, to third party operators. Uh, they have now given the AGCO the authority to go ahead and be the uh, the body that is going to go to an issue. We'll call them licenses. They actually aren't even sure what they're going to call them uh, when it gets there. Um, th this past week, the a AGCO set up their iGaming subsidiary. So we can see that there is actually movement. And as David said earlier, the timeline seems to be end of the year to be in a position to have international operators available in the marketplace to uh, deliver their product to consumers. I, I think that you're going to find anybody and everybody who wants to come to uh, Canada, look at the Ontario, look at Ontario is a great opportunity. The, the, the Ontario yeah. market, 14 million people, we, we punch way above our weight in, in online gaming in general, uh, going all the way back to, uh, you can trace Ontario's growth in online gaming to the, uh, the hockey strike in 20, uh, 2004 and Chris Moneymaker winning the World Series of Poker. Uh, you just saw this crazy spike where there's nothing else on TV except this thing called the World Series of Poker, and all of a sudden poker takes off and online gaming takes off. We have a lot of roots in the history of online gaming, actually out of uh, Toronto in particular, out of the province of Ontario. So I do, I do think that there's going to be a really big market here, uh, and I think that you're going to find any anybody who wants to come to this market. The regime seems to be an open marketplace, so no uh, unlimited licenses available. I think that's the healthiest market. Doesn't create what you see in the US in some markets where they limit licenses. It creates artificial uh, artificial value creation for some and devaluing for others. And it creates just an unhealthy market where the operators can't be competitive. And uh, I, you know, one of the things that um, that I would certainly stress when, when government, uh, as government sort of sits down and looks at what are the final regs, competition is going to come from all angles the internet is by its nature open competition yeah. and there are going to be a lot of operators who just don't want to get licensed and the only way that you can continue to channel as much as possible through the regulated markets is going to be by making sure the product that's out there is competitive things like poker need to have liquidity you need to have lots and lots of liquidity if you regulate poker just to the province of ontario you're gonna have a less competitive product than if they have it available to all Canadians and potentially out to the world. It also talks about the type of products. What type of betting are you going to make available in play betting? What type of advertising are you going to allow? All of those things are critical to make sure that the ecosystem so of if you don't, online gaming works. There. Like what, what, what's, give me an example of an operator that doesn't obtain a license. He doesn't have a lot of the stuff that you outlined. So what are the advantages in addition to what you've already said, we opposed to say an operator that would not have a license? Yeah, so an operator who does, let, let's say uh, if you have an operator who does not have a license, they don't have to pay the taxes that a operator that would have a license would pay. They would also, they're not subject to the same sort of rules and jurisdiction terms, player protections. They can also offer things like credit. 
where a licensed operator tends not to be able to offer credit to their uh, to their teams. Why? So then the big question is, why would somebody like, you know, you have an operator like Bet365 currently operating in the yeah. Ontario marketplace, why would they go and willingly say, hey, I'm about to pay 15 to 20% tax and I'm good with that? And that's a question a lot of people ask. And the, the real answer is because it's good business. Yeah, of course. At the end of the day, it's stable. You much rather, and, and coming from my, my years at Stars Group, we were very focused. And part of what I did was open up these markets. We were incredibly focused on our desire to pay tax. It creates a stable market. It creates rules and regulations that ensure that you as a business, an operator, in particular publicly traded company, that you can go to your shareholders and say, that's a good market that I'm operating in, as opposed to if you're operating in an unregulated market like Russia. Those markets can change on a dime and your revenue can be impacted significantly. Interesting. You'd much rather have the stability of a regulated market. David, what would you say are the expectations when it comes to homegrown competition? Um, you know, my expectation is that it's going to be a very competitive market. You have, you know, as Jordan was saying, Bet365, one of the largest operators in the world, uh, you know, with significant uh, human and capital resources, that's already here. Uh, you know, it's going to cause, you know, with the domestic players to up their game very quick uh, to deliver a compelling uh, product and service uh, to the consumers. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll cause the cream to rise. Right. Um, you know, as Jordan was saying with, you know, bet 365 being in Canada already in advance of it actually, you know, being regulated, let's say, you know, everybody wants to operate in the light. You have a global business that has certain standards around the world, you know, I think they're all going to revert to the mean and, and it's, it's about global best practices. At the end of the day, the internet is a global platform. Uh, so, you know, everyone's got to keep their pencil sharp and uh, make sure they're delivering the best product, uh, most compelling service. Uh, and that's in full compliance with laws. Uh, you know, back to what Scott was saying with the enforcement and the education, I think, I think that's a, a huge part of what's necessary to help the market mature as quickly as possible. You know, if we take a couple steps back and look at what happened with legalization of marijuana in Canada, you know, there was a lag between legalization uh, and the displacement or even starting to see displacement of the black market with what you see, um, you know, today. Obviously, there's still room for growth. I think, you know, my hope is that the government uh, was taking notes on that process to eliminate yeah. that lag time. You know, my hope is that, you know, the regulations are established, they're clear, concise, they're competitive, and, you know, let us as, you know, entrepreneurs and, and uh, business owners um, get at it as quick as possible. 100%, let's go, right? And it's like, I'm looking at this industry, and unlike cannabis, um, paint the picture and a question for all of you, and Scott will begin with you, but what is the marketing branding opportunities present from this industry? You look south of the border right now, and a lot of the Fox Sports regional markets have now changed to Bally Sports. Uh, could we see a lot of like uh, naming rights to arenas? Like paint the picture as to what we can look like from a pure branding opportunity that this market will present itself. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the branding opportunities will will you know almost almost get to the, be the size of the, the the betting market. You see the the numbers going around in customer acquisition costs in the U.S. and the marketing spends that. FanDuel's and DraftKings are doing it's it's kind of insane and, and we'll see that here um, you know we're already starting to see it with certain groups that are doing .NET sponsorships of teams and organizations and hockey rinks um, so it will be a, a tidal wave of uh, you know a land grab um, I think we saw that in the U.S. we'll see it here uh, naming rights uh, jersey rights the everything will be done we'll see you know Sports books in in arena, uh, all the things you see in the U.S. I expect to see see here. Um, you know the the CFLs. You know they were talking about it helping to save the CFL. Right. Uh, and, you know the leagues are going to benefit from this. So we saw a major. Think about that. Out. A brand new industry that's old, but at looking at already saving a league and it's just getting started. Right. That's the kind yeah. of pull and leverage it has. Right. Yeah, I was just going to just touch on what Scott said. If you, if you sort of think about the the amount of money that gets spent to acquire customers. Uh, and you think about what feeds this ecosystem. And David mentioned earlier about the, the job creation here. Sports betting, we tend to focus on a lot as the operator yeah. because that's the, that's the brand. That's the retail front door that you see. It says, it says FanDuel. Um, but at the end of the day, 
what you really end up seeing is that the you know the ecosystem is populated by a whole bunch of service providers yeah whether they are content providers whether they are fans providers like my company playmaker we're in the business of delivering fans into the ecosystem all of those things are critically important for the success so when we think about this industry it isn't just what those retailers spend and where they spend it. it's also all of the other elements of it that are delivering economic benefit right. to it. So the naming rights are one thing, but the ability to get commercial advertising is another thing, but it's just also the ancillary product and the ancillary purchases that get done in order to really drive a very healthy ecosystem. Truthfully, I love the amount of advertising they're spending because uh, that's, uh, that, that's the business that I'm in. So I, yeah. I absolutely love it. Well, when we look at this industry, like I look at the state of New Jersey, there's 9 million people. They did $5 billion in revenue last year in sports betting. You look at Canada right now, as you said before, Jordan, 14 million people that live in this province, 30 million across the country, 35 million, I should say. We look at a lot of like, obviously the user that are betting on games, mm. but I'm always trying to educate people, even at our platform to educate, look at the bigger picture. And that's the stock market within these industries. So based off of that, what kind of opportunities does this present knowing that this industry will mature and the opportunities that it'll present for investors in this space. Listen, I think that if you take a look at the companies, you have the score we talked about earlier, DraftKings, uh, FanDuel is looking at whether they do an IPO, all of the SPAC market opportunities that have come out, the capital markets are looking for places to place a bet. Yeah. And sports betting is as good of an industry as any. It's the same as, you know, we've mentioned marijuana industry. It's something that just was, it's been around forever, but all of a sudden it's come out of the shadows. Yeah. And that allows for commercial and institutional investors to get into businesses that are mature by virtue of the fact that there is a built-in economy around them. The question is, how fast do we bring it from the shadows into the light? And sports betting is going to be the exact same thing. But there are going to be winners and losers. Yeah. There's no question there are going to be winners and losers. Nobody's making money right now as retailers. Uh, there are definitely profitable parts of the ecosystem. People selling content into it, the do a geolocation services, payment processing, the advertising deliverers. They're all making money today in that part of the ecosystem. And if you're betting on the sports betting world, if you will, I would encourage investors to look up and down that value chain to take a pick of where it is that you want to be. There are free to, game, free to play games providers, it's a fee for service provider. There are B2B providers who are providing the technology and operational expertise for the front end retailers. So the big brands are out there. They're the ones spending money on advertising. There are going to be winners and losers in that because not everybody can continue to burn you know, 10, 50, $100 million a month right, in exactly. advertising. And we've got giants. Yeah, and, you know, David, those gi those giants can spend a lot. David, winners and losers. Like you're building, obviously, a platform. Canada is an important market for you, but let's face it, you guys are international as well, and in China. So, winners and losers. How do you compete with some of the bigger brands from the early days, and what's your long term, I guess, sustainability for the uh, drive of the company? Yeah. So, so again, you know, just to echo what Jordan was saying. You know, it, it's you uh, use the mining analogy. There's picks and shovels, right? You know, yep. um, there's a lag time between the starting starting of development, feeding the entire ecosystem, right? There, there's lots of offshoots of that, and then ultimately we have the consumer facing, you know, operating brands. Uh, you know, fandoms trying to differentiate itself by developing technologies that increase the user experience across, you know, uh, the consumer facing ecosystem. So whether it's business to business, business to consumer, so, you know, it, it, uh, following behind what, what Scott's been able to do with fans unite. Right. So, um, you know, th there's different parts of the ecosystem. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, customer acquisition costs, the, the amount of money, 50 million, a hundred million a month for customer acquisition, th there's very few people that can compete with that. Uh, very, very few, less than, you know, less than a handful. And there'll be even winners and losers even at that scale. Yeah. So, you know, you know what's the differentiating factor? What, what's the uniqueness? What's the value add to various parts of the ecosystem? Um, you know, if, if you remove gambling, it, it's the same economic question that you have to ask yourself in every single sector that, that, that you would consider investing in. And uh, I think if companies uh, remain focused on, on you know, what, what they're good at, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, small steps lead to big breakthroughs is, is a mantra of mine. And you just got to keep executing on what your core mission is. And 
you know, it's, the race is on it. That, that's what makes all of this fun, right? You guys made big news, obviously, earlier this year with the merger of Ascot Entertainment and uh, Fans Unite. So is this a trend that we'll see? And what should investors take out of this as far as getting to know the industry more? Yeah, I mean, uh, consolidation, I think, will be a trend. Um, you know, we're going to we're, we're starting to see it. And I think we saw that in more mature markets. So I think Jordan mentioned it like it's kind of a new market in North America, but it's a very mature market in other areas like Europe. So where we have seen a lot of consolidation and I think that's going to happen here. Um, you've already seen some big ones with DraftKings and, DraftKings and SB Tech. And so I think part of that land grab is to acquire as much assets as you can and and ours was a merge of bringing technology together with some operations or you know the operation of the retail type sites um so i think you'll see a lot of people examining their tech and deciding that maybe they need to own it um you know historically i think a lot of operators were really the marketing branding uh, side of the business and relied on a few big players for the technology piece. Um, I think at the scale these companies are getting to, they're, they're gonna bring that in house and, and that's where we kind of sat. Uh, we were, you know, we've been building technology around the betting space for five years, yep. multiple yeah. licenses, um, really with a focus on esports. So the Ascot Entertainment business was an e you know, shifted in 2014 to be an esports betting group. Um, that served us well, but then we, we were bringing traditional sports back into the mix as, as the U.S. opened up and, and as Canada was approaching. So that's how the merge with Fans Unite happened. So, yeah, I expect there to be plenty of consolidation, and that's, that's really where the public markets come in, I think. So, you know, as a publicly traded company, um, you know, we've done two financings this year, so three within the last 12 months um and two acquisitions one being that merge so so we are we're preparing for that and and being publicly traded helps so so you want to look at people i think who are strong cash positions uh a good business model good teams um, yeah, yeah. And, and can establish themselves in a regulated market uh because there, there's going to be people out there you know either being bought or or, or being the buyers when it comes to betting right now, from the feedback that I get, it's almost divided right down the middle. People that are 35 and younger and people that are 35 and older. COVID has changed a lot of things. So question for all of you, and Scott, we'll stick with you. Um, paint the picture for me. When it comes to the esports side, the virtual side and the betting side, um, we see where this is going and the trend that's going to develop. Um, what should people take note that are traditional sports betting people? And how much growth have you seen, obviously, since... Uh, uh, COVID changed a number of things across our world. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the traditional sports betting people, and, and I think they, they've all come around, uh, which was different from when we started in 2014 talking about esports, is that you have a, a, a massive group of people here who are, you know, 18 to 30 year olds currently and a huge tidal wave of them coming behind who are esports fans. You know, we're approaching 700 million esports fans in the world. A uh, recent survey of them said 52% would, would bet on esports. Um, and then you see the drop off of traditional sports betting fans. So I think as an operator, you've got to pay attention to a traditional sports book. Um, you have to look at that and say, you know, there's a future here. Uh, you know, I think some UK operators during the pandemic saw esports and probably virtual betting thrown in there of, you know, rising up to three to five percent of turnover. Um, you know, we're hearing that people expect esports betting to be 10 percent of turnover in the next decade, um, which turns into some, some really big numbers. But I think it's a different type of product. So so just tacking esports or sliding it into an existing sports book. That's kind of our argument is that that's a challenge. So we, we've kind of come at it from a different angle and, and that's what we provide to people. So a pretty quick solution to esports betting, which we think is highly engaging, um, tailored to the esports fans. And, and it just can't be ignored at the size of this market and, and how it's grown. Jordan, you're a CEO. You're well entrenched speaking to people every day. What are some of the trends and feedback that you receive? Yeah, so I, I think the the... The most compelling trends that we see in, in, in general is that people are looking for a new way to be engaged with traditional sports 
and to make sure that that viewing experience and that level of loyalty and experience that mm -hmm. they have just in the true social environment around everything else they do in the social world is brought into sports. Right. And sports, uh, we, we view sports as, uh, as it's the great equalizer. Uh, you, know, you, walk, you walk into Scotiabank Arena, the person you're sitting next to, you could be in the Platinums, uh, these tickets are $400 a ticket. The person next to, sitting next to you could have bought the ticket or could have won it uh, at a raffle, could have been given to them because uh, their employer gave it to them. Right. But for the next three hours, you're all a Raptors fan. Right. And when the Raptors score, you're high-fiving. And that's the great equalizer of sports. And what I think we're, we're going to see is we're going to see a continued trend in have, how we continue to build that community around it and that community of inclusion. I think esports has done a fantastic job in doing that with you know, the advent of platforms like Twitch. Twitch brought a community together. It took people who were sitting in discrete places in your, in your home or in an esports club and said, I can talk to somebody else. I can watch somebody else. I can create chats with other people. And that is how a younger demographic communicate. I used to call my friends. My children text their friends. It's not, and, and they say, I spoke to so-and-so. Well, they didn't actually use words out of their mouth, but that is the way that they communicate. You know, my parents wrote letters. They didn't talk on the phone. So mm -hmm. we just have an evolution of communication. And I think that's really the trend is how do we continue to create uh, create communication and content that keeps people compelled. Sports betting is one way to do that. Esports is growing like crazy. Who would have ever thought five, ten years ago that you'd be building esports purpose-built arenas? Right. I mean, that's that's beyond sort of the average. I'm just going to put up a website. I'm just going to. That's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of commitment to infrastructure. That's when you know something, I believe, has really sort of hit the mainstream, is when people who are in traditional businesses, like real estate, right. come back and say, there's an opportunity here to put a venue in place that I think I can fill. That, 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 that's a really, really compelling argument to say the trend of esports is a, is a real trend. This is not a fad. So does it make sense from a business strategy for all of you to focus on, <clears throat> try not to flip, let's say, a traditional sports better to an esports betting platform? and just focus on what they know? Or does it make sense to obviously get them to flip? And David, we'll begin with you. Uh, yeah, just again, to tackle what Jordan's saying, it's not a question of flipping from one to the other. Right. I think you know the, the trend that we're seeing ultimately is a convergence of user experience, of fan engagement, of community building. So whether you just want to you know, challenge someone to a prediction, challenge them to a wager, go to a full, full-fledged, you know, sophisticated parlay bet with statistics. Uh, I think the ultimate winners in the industry from an investment perspective, from a business perspective, are going to be, uh, you know, the companies and the firms that create that, you know, environment for people to interact with each other in a compelling way that allows them to do these different things in a centralized platform, in a stadium, or maybe even, you know, as I'm watching it at home, I'm challenging my friend that's in a stadium, you know, second period, I get a notification. You know, Shaz just challenged me to do a bet that, you know, someone's going to score a goal this period, right? Uh, we're only limited by our... Uh, I won that uh, bet, right? Know. Did I win that bet? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, yeah, you know, I just sent you 20 bucks. There you go. <laughs> but uh, all joking aside, you know, it's creating that experience, uh, you know, um, building out the technological capabilities to, to, you know, speak to a global community, whether it's an esports fan, a sports yeah. fan, what's the difference? Yeah. You know, I, I have... You know, uh, nephews that, you know, are AAA hockey players, they don't watch hockey on TV. They watch, you know, EA sports, uh, you know, esports hockey. So wh where do you draw the line? Uh, so, you know, my prediction is in five to 10 years, it's all esports. It, it, as Jordan was saying, it's content, it's engagement. And, you know, whether you want to take a bet or, you know, shoot a tweet or a message or a text or an emoji, as long as you're facilitating that, those interactions and touch points, you know, uh, I think that's where the real value will come in. Makes sense. You know, um, well said and times are changing for sure. I want to wrap up, obviously, this a conversation, this panel was some of the stuff that we talked about earlier with regards to Canada. Um, it's across Canada provinces will be left to decide exactly what single game betting will look like within their respective borders. The rumors are that for in Toronto, for example, for instance, is eyeing internet gaming market that could allow private sector firms to compete against one another for business and bets, while others may opt for something more restrictive. So saying this, what is the preference of the industry and does a patchwork set of regulations across the country 
present a new set of challenges? If so, what do you anticipate? And David, we'll begin with you. Uh, listen, I don't think anybody wants a patchwork uh, of rules and regulations. It's, it, it complicates business and increases costs to business. Um, you know, ideally, you'd want a level playing field with everybody. You know, I think some of the advantages that uh, some of the operators that are in the country have now is that there are no regulations. So they do what they want. And going back to Scott's point with, with, with the education and the enforcement, you know, that ultimately filters down to, to the user, to the player experience. So, um, you know, one regu dealing with one regulator is tough enough. Uh, having to deal with 10 or 11, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't help. Um, but again, you know, it's it's a uh, uh, high risk industry uh, in terms of, you know, it's history, but uh, the faster that they can put the best practices into place, uh, I, I don't think anybody on this panel would hesitate uh, to follow the, the letter and the spirit of, of, those, of those practices. Yeah, Scott, you care to comment? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say, what would the industry want? We would definitely want to see an open market. So I think the way Ontario is heading is probably the best approach. Um, same as David, patchwork is bad uh, for us, and uh, but it's what I expect we're going to get at least initially. So um, we're we're optimistic in terms of the the opportunities that are opening up for companies like ourselves in Canada. Um, wait and see uh, on how that rolls out. How do you see this all unfolding, Jordan? Yeah, so I, I I agree with Scott and David. You know, this this is going to in an ideal world. You would uh, you would have one set of rules, uh, but we don't live in this ideal world, and you we haven't seen that happen yet. Uh, there is hope, uh, and there is hope that there will be some commonality. Tax rates will be different uh, in each province because each province has a different need and want, or has a different bent towards. Is it about money or is it about uh, consumer protection? And so tax rates aren't very difficult for operators to manage between. The good news is that Ontario is going first, and the AGCO is a global leading regulator. This, this, is, this is not a small town backwards company. The AGCO is globally recognized as one of the top regulating bodies. In the, and so the fact that they're the ones who are setting the initial framework, a standards-based approach to this is very, very encouraging. Mm. And so it is possible that we'll see the other provinces adopt if not all, but most of what the AGCO has put in place, save and accept, I think tax rates will be different in each province. Some provinces, as you have in the US, uh, some states won't allow college sports. Some provinces may have particular products or offerings or markets that they aren't going to make available. But ultimately, if we can end up with a, a really, really close uh, set of rules around, uh, around this, uh, I think we're going to be I think we're going to be in a really, really good spot. You know, the provinces have a uh, have a experience, strong experience of working together. The Interprovincial Lottery Corporation was set up, you know, decades ago to do games like 649 and Lotto Max and national scratch tickets. So there are products that are already interprovincial, shared amongst the same set of rules across the whole country. However, the proceeds all go to different places. So they do figure out a way to mm -hmm. find what is good for me as the province of Alberta versus the province of Saskatchewan, yet we as uh, the province of Ontario may have a different view. So I'm hoping that the provinces look to the current structure, the Interprovincial Lottery Corp, as a model for how they can work together and use the AGCO as who I would be the top tiered regulator in the country as the, uh, as the one who's going to create a framework that they all, that they all live within. Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, I would say it's, uh, I'm hopeful, I'm not, I'm not entirely optimistic that it'll be as simple as I've described it. But as I said, we, we couldn't be in a better place knowing that Ontario is really the one going first. Well, the bill has passed. That's the first step, right? We're still early stages. I want to wrap things up. Uh, this panel has been uh, presented by the Dales Report, Amuka Esports, and most importantly, the Canadian Securities Exchange. So let's wrap things up here in Canada. Number of estimates on the true value of this market. DraftKings recently said Canada is a five to eight billion dollar market. Bet MGM says uh, sees it at seven billion. So when you look at this industry over the next ten years, what kind of potential exists? And how could this spa uh, space actually get uh, as far as overall growth? It's a question for all of you, and we'll wrap it up here. But Jordan, we'll begin with you, and then after with Scott and David. 
Sure. There's, you know, there's often a bunch of uh, metrics that are put out there. One of them is uh, revenue and the other one is handle. Uh, and, uh, and so if we're talking about actual revenue, not uh, the amount of money that's wagered, if you, you know, my view is if you add together sports betting and iGaming, uh, you know, this is, this is easy, in my mind, an easily a $10 billion uh, revenue market, not handle, but actual revenue generated. It's great. Scott? Yeah, I, I can't disagree. That's kind of the numbers we've been thinking, you know, maybe slightly higher, but in that eight to 12 million or sorry, billion is, is what we've been doing. Uh, and again, looking at revenue and, and not, you know, the, the actual the, the size of the bet volume. And David? It's strike three. Uh, those numbers are pretty accurate. Um, it's not going to be a hundred billion dollar market, unfortunately, but uh, it, it's large enough market that, uh, you know, you have, Three firms such as ourselves on this panel going after the same piece of pie, and I'm sure uh, everyone's going to have a nice uh, piece on their plate uh, as we all continue Great. to execute on our plans. David Vinokurov, CEO of Fandom uh, Media Sports Group, uh, trades of the CSC under the ticker symbol FDM. Scott Burton, Fans Unite CEO, trades of the CSC under the ticker symbol FANS. And Jordan Gannat, the founder and CEO of Playmaker Capital. Thank you for taking part and place your bets. We appreciate your time, gentlemen. Well, there you have it. That was uh, that was phenomenal. That was another really deep dive, uh, very educational. Phil, um, are you ready to start betting on esports? Oh yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, that was good. Thanks, Chad, again to uh, for your moderation. Chad's uh, at the Dale's Report is uh, he's an old pro at this. He's from the broadcasting background, so you could tell with this setup there. Uh, look, everyone, thank you again for watching. Uh, we're actually going to be almost exactly on time today. This is a two-hour program. Um, just a few people we got to thank. Uh, first and foremost, Phil, great job. You did a lot of the organizing for my co-host today. I uh, appreciate you being here today. First time we've done this. So uh, thank you. Thank you for being a part of it today. And um, as well, uh, other people on our team that have contributed to this, Anil Mall. Uh, you may see him in the air meet if you're on air meet right now. He's uh, obviously been a big part of bringing uh, the clients to this. And then Barrington Miller, who uh, voiced over our opening video as well. So thank you, Barrington. And then finally, Sparks Publishing, which helped with a lot of the, the marketing of this event. And of course, our uh, co-sponsors co or media partners, I should say, uh, the Dales Report and Amuki Sports. Uh, ben Pfefferman, Shad Dales. Uh, couldn't have done this without their help. So uh, really exciting. I mean, um, I was just scanning through my LinkedIn. I just saw that Fans Unite just closed a $25 million private placement. So there's more money coming into the space. Nice. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to, a lot to come. So, um, I don't know, should we do this again, Phil? I, I'm wondering, cause, um, this, this industry keeps changing, uh, a year from now, so many things will be different. Any predictions that you might have, um, you know, until that time as this whole thing will play out. I'm, I, I think we're definitely going to see continued growth. Uh, there'll be more players coming to the space, much more in the, um, the gambling sp sector specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. But having said that, I mean, the esports and the gaming side is already, already extremely robust. So, um, you know, things uh, will look very interesting and investors will have lots of opportunities to look into different uh, investment companies. So, Yep. I would uh, just uh, keep an eye on uh, the CSC. We'll likely, hopefully, list a good amount of these companies. Uh, but having said that, um, the the sector, to answer your question, will likely be extremely vibrant in the next three to five years. Yep, absolutely. So uh, once again, thanks. I'm James Black. This is Philip Shum from the CSC. If this is your first time on one of these events, make sure you subscribe, uh, either on YouTube or at CSC News on Twitter. Facebook, LinkedIn, anywhere where you're watching right now or, or have access to on social media. Uh, we constantly put out content. We're always hosting events. We're really looking forward to connecting with you again and uh, maybe even in person. So once again, this was eSports in the Capital Markets, a proud presentation of the Canadian Securities Exchange. Have a wonderful day. Welcome to eSports in the Capital Markets, a special presentation of the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with Amica eSports and the Dales Report.
Join the CSE as we investigate the world of esports in a post-COVID world, including the themes and players that will dominate the next era of this rapidly growing industry. We will explore the impact of legalized gambling on the sector and the massive potential this convergence will have for investors. Where education meets opportunity, this is esports in the capital markets.